face to face and today I'm with Maikichi with uh, Suru for solidarity with a Japanese American organization who has been fighting on behalf of the immigrant community in New York. Mike, welcome to face to face. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here, David. You're welcome. Uh, so can you give us a little bit of, of background about uh, uh, your organization and uh, historical why are you standing on behalf of the immigrant community in the U.S.? during World War II and the Japanese camp in uh, detention center? Sure. Um, Suru means crane in Japanese. And uh, in our culture, the crane is a symbol of transformation of, of peace, nonviolence, and well-being. Um, hearkening back to World War II, there was a young girl who survived the bombing of Hiroshima, the nuclear bombing. Her name was Sadako Ikeda. And she folded a thousand cranes um, with the wish that if you folded a thousand cranes, then you would be granted a wish. And her wish was to be uh, well, to survive um, leukemia. Um, and children from all over the world, all over Japan initially, and then all over the world, um, sent her cranes because they wanted her wish to come true. Um, that that sort of uh, idea caught on around the world and children since then have folded cranes as a sign of peace and nonviolence. Well, so let's go back to the United States. During World War II, the uh, United States government um, incarcerated, rounded up, and then incarcerated over 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry. Most of them were immigrants who had not been allowed to naturalize, so they could not become citizens. They were held in a permanent status as what they called enemy aliens. Their children, however, were citizens. And my mother was one of these people who was a child citizen at that time. And her entire family, along with the rest of the community, were rounded up and they were taken to inland concentration camps. She was held in, in Idaho for instance, at the camp called Minidoka. And um, so what we're realizing today is that this carceral history in the United States has played out through different communities. And this idea of forced relocations, uh, indefinite detentions, separation of families, and deportation, as well as long-term imprisonment, has affected every uh, community of color in the United States. It's part of the history of the country, dating back to forced removals and imprisonment of native people, taking them from their homelands and putting them in reservations or in prisons. Um, the forced removal of people of African heritage, bringing them to the United States um, against their will and putting them into uh, enslavement. We are using the same camp where your family or the Japanese American have been incarcerated during World War II. It's right. the same places. Yes. And so if you look at what's going on now in terms of carceral history and how it's come up to the present, there's this ongoing incarceration and targeting of poor people and black and brown people in the United States in particular. I would also add native indigenous people. Yeah. Um, and, and so, of course, since the Trump administra administration took office, this has been amped up, but it actually existed before the Trump administration. And under the Obama administration, they started building um, large detention sites on the border of Texas with Mexico because there was such an influx of people fleeing violence, basically, a lot of that due to the international um, terrorism of, of Western superpowers destabilizing countries, people were fleeing violence and they were coming north trying to come into the United States. The Obama administration set up these detention sites along the border. And what, what we're now often, well, there's two of them in particular that have become very infamous in Texas, the Carnes Center and the Dilly Center. And these are where families were, were held but also where children were taken away from their parents. Yeah. This was a family separation. Yeah. So this blew up in the summer of 2018. That's when I first heard about it and a number of other Japanese Americans started getting involved. It turned out that there was a Japanese American 
uh, American Civil Liberties Union attorney Carl Takei, who whose job it was was to sort of um, to be involved with these detention sites. He actually was able to go inside and he was the first to raise the red flag. He said, wait a minute, these are very similar to what they used to incarcerate his, his grandparents yeah. and, and, and our whole community. And then he brought in a, a very famous um, uh, uh, psychologist, uh, Dr. Saski Ina, who's very famous for her her research and work in the Japanese American community with people who that were children so inside concentration camps. So she did a documentary called Children of the Camps. Yeah. And she's done a lot of work with, with people who were, were traumatized this way. In fact, her specialty is community is trauma. Yeah. So we got together and there was a pilgrimage, uh, a, a, a trip back to one of the former concentration camps in Texas at a site called Crystal City where they um, imprisoned a whole bunch of Japanese Americans and also Japanese people from South America who they kidnapped and brought to the United States during World War II. They, f they basically coerced and forced their governments to give them all the Japanese people. They brought them to the United States to places, uh, camps such as Crystal City in Texas. And their, their intention was to use those South American Japanese heritage people as prisoner of war exchanges with Japan. So it, it gets a very, it's a very complicated. It's a twisted. very geopolitical story. Very much so. The violence of this is, is, is international. So if you come back to 2018, when we were visiting one of these former sites, well, it turns out that the family detention center holding about what, I think it's somewhere around 3000 uh, uh, children and their parents in Dilly, Texas was just down the same highway, 40 miles. So we went there to stage a protest because we said this is too similar to what we experienced and we will not remain silent while this goes on but we folded we asked our community we said we know on a, a short notice that you all can't travel with us there were 50 of us who went but we said fold the cranes the origami the folded paper cranes yep. um Mm -hmm. that, that became so famous from Sadako Ikeda, the young girl in yeah. Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. Full those cranes representing the 125,000 people in our community, Japanese Americans as well as Japanese brought from South America. Full those cranes and we will bring them and we're going to hang them on the fence at the protest symbolizing that our community stands in solidarity with people who are being mistreated in the same way that our community was mistreated. And so some some of the people who were part of that rally were actually uh, kids who were born into some of the camp, and they were uh, 50 years later standing up for the immigrant community, uh, who was mainly Latino and um, and 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 uh, from South America. So it's mm -hmm. very it, it was a very touching uh, and and a strong statement from people who are now in their. 70s and 80s to stand up for uh, for a community uh, other than their own and and really uh, revisiting the history who's coming back into daylight now. Um, so during that time, you were planning to organize something more uh, in Washington D.C. on June 6 and 7, and then now is going to be uh, is going to be online. So can you can you give us a little bit of What's going to happen on the six and seven? Yeah. So in the year since that first action at Dilly, we've gone on to uh, protest in Oklahoma at Fort Sill. We stopped them from bringing 1,600 children, unaccompanied children from the border, to be imprisoned there. Uh, we've been involved at a whole bunch of detention site fights around the country. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic and the the terrible crisis it's causing around the world. Um, gatherings such as the one we were planning uh, in front of the White House on June 6th and 7th had to be postponed. So what we've decided to do is pivot and we're going to have a virtual protest online the same weekend. And we're basically inviting people from all over the world to join us. Our website is Sudu for Solidarity. That's our name, Sudu for Solidarity. And Sudu is spelled T as in Teresa, S-U-R-U, Sudu for Solidarity.org. If you go to our website, on the front homepage, there is a, a, a registration page 
to join us for this weekend of action. And it's free, it's online, anyone can participate. So what we're going to do is on that Saturday, the 6th, we're having two different programs. The morning program is very much about um, revisiting the history of our actions because it's actually quite a beautiful story about yeah. a community that was intentionally fractured by the racism of the United States government and has come back together, reclaimed its and voice United, and yeah. deciding to stand with other people in, in defense of children in this case and families. Um, in the process of doing that, what we did was we began to heal our own intergenerational trauma. We didn't realize that would happen. And that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful unexpected uh, result. So the program will talk about that journey for us, but it will also feature directly impacted frontline community leaders who are working in solidarity with us and other communities across the United States to get the more than 40,000 people who are currently detained during a pandemic where they are denied hygiene, they cannot socially distance. The conditions are unbelievable. It's terrible. They're being yeah. infected and they're, um, and they're dying. They're starting to die. Uh, the US just rolled out a brand new, more inhumane and cruel policy than ever last uh, two weeks ago. They said, for families who are currently in detention with children, you can remain there. Of course, well, they, they will be infected. Or if you ask to be released, then you have to sign away the custody of your children and we will take your children away from you. And what will probably happen is then the parents would be deported and the children, in some cases, in Texas, they ask the parents, would you, uh, would you give up your children for adoption? So to choose to be free yeah, yeah, from means you lose your, your children. This is, I mean, how cruel. It's an in, in extreme violence, not just on a physical level, but certainly on a psychological level. So we're, we're bringing those leaders together and we're gonna be talking together about how can we oppose this, the importance of solidarity in this moment to oppose this kind of violence and figure out new ways forward that brings everyone together because um, the, current, the current system that is so built on the contradictions of violence is going to collapse. It has to, it cannot sustain itself. And we need to be prepared with answers to figure out how do we stop them from hurting more people and how do we provide solutions to provide something better and newer for people who are fleeing violence from all over the world and are encountering violence when they come to our borders. Um, you, you, you were able to expand your reach to not just the Japanese, but also to the African-American, to the Latino community, to the indigenous community. How, how are they going to get involved in, on, the, on the six and seven? Well, certainly everyone is, is, is invited to join in on, on the programs on the six. So there's that morning program that will be um, a lot of speakers, uh, panelists from different communities. Uh, we are a proud member of the Detention Watch Network, which is uh, a network of anti-detention organizations uh, from many different communities. There's over, I think, over 130 organizations in this network, and they're going to be centrally involved, and we're going to have some of the uh, national organizers of, of DWN involved there. Um, one of the leaders from one of the most uh, powerful resistance organizations in Tacoma, Washington, uh, called La Resistencia, um, Maru Mora will be part of that panel. And she is currently, um, she's led a, a fight there since 2011 to get people released from detention. And there's currently a hunger strike going on during the pandemic um, across the country. Inmates, uh, prisoners are, are uh, on a hunger strike and she's been very involved in helping them to get organized on the inside. Um, she's, a, she's an amazing woman herself. She's also um, being targeted for deportation herself. Um, that evening, we'll have a second program, and there's going to be a, a national, we're calling it a national Buddhist ceremony for the healing of the country. Um, we're paying uh, remembrances through a Buddhist healing ceremony for all of the people who have died in detention, and also all of our own people who were incarcerated in concentration camps. And that will be conducted by uh, Buddhist priests from around the country. People will be able to, on the chat boxes online, submit the names of people they want included in the ceremony. And the Buddhist clergy will write their names, 
submitted names on wooden tablets that will be, and every person's name will be chanted as part of this healing ceremony. Uh, it, it dates back to a very ancient Buddhist ceremony that was conducted on an annual basis in ancient Japan to heal the country and remember the ancestors. Um, on the next day, Sunday, we're doing two big things. In the morning, in, in cities all across the United States, Japanese Americans and allies will gather together in uh, socially distanced, safe, small gatherings to uh, protest at detention sites, maybe at governor's uh, residences, uh, county commissioners at re residences, bringing attention to the fact that people are dying inside of these cages during a pandemic. And we're going to live stream broadcast that across all of our social media pages, Sudo for Solidarity, as well as on our website. So the whole program on Saturday and Sunday will be live streamed from yes. our website so and of course on social media. In the afternoon of that day, we're holding what we call Healing Circles for Change. And if you register for our weekend through our website, you can, you can uh, sign up to be a part of one of these groups. And these are something that we do at every uh, protest. We, we show up, we protest, and then we gather cross commu uh, communities, gather in a talk circle. And we tell our stories about what happened around the carceral history of our communities. And what we found is that in those sharing sharings, people start to heal their trauma from the violence. And when we learn the stories of other communities, what we find is that there is an incredible solidarity that is built there. And so this is how we've built a movement that's, that's based on standing together. We're always stronger together. People have more in common than they, they realize. And, and, and also to overcome the trauma then people have also uh, experienced during their, their life. So, uh, because most of the immigrant community or, or people of color have always uh, experienced a lot of uh, trauma. So um, we need to wrap up. Anything besides everything you have already plugged, I will put the, the link to the site. Anything else you want to, to plug before we wrap up? Well, I just want to say, once again, go to sudoforsolidarity.org. If you look on the front homepage, you'll see the registration tab for the uh, June 6th and 7th events. And uh, if you just come to our website, you can also just watch the events. You don't even have to register. If, if you don't want to participate in the healing circles, you can just show up and, and click on the webpage and you can, you can participate in that way too. And we really welcome you and we're excited uh, for the weekend, we're calling it Sudu Rising, a virtual protest to close the camps. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, that was your show face to face. And please keep watching your news on Presenza.com and hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you.